Hey guys, Bud Cat Seven here. Okay, it is Monday, February seventeenth, twenty twenty, and I'd like to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. I really do appreciate it. All right, guys. Well, in this video, we're going to discuss Paleo Hebrew and what it is, and the reason why I wanted to do it is because. Often we hear in the accounts of uh, certain inscriptions on stone in areas in the Americas where you have these ancient languages evidently inscribed in some of the artifacts from around the Americas. And once in a while you will hear about this Paleo-Hebrew as being inscribed in uh, some of these stones. So I've read it in a number of accounts, and then if you go into like sort of these uh, weird religious um, archaeology, which I, you know, even the Mormons too, I think they do great archaeology, to be honest with you. And, um, you know, I don't agree with everything, but. You know, they do some really good archaeology based on what they think of whatever it is that they think. But it's interesting to hear about what they have to say. But you'll hear about this Paleo-Hebrew. So I'm thinking to myself, because I know a little bit about it, and, you know, this is supposedly from the Canaanite Phoenician language systems, and related in those ways, you can always, you know, think about this, everything involved with this stuff. And I wanted to know exactly what was considered um, Paleo-Hebrew. And before we get to that, I was just watching Robert Seffer do legendary libraries of the ancient world. He just did a couple on giants. And now he's doing one of the legendary libraries of the ancient world. Always, I don't know, me and Robert just got some sort of wavelength thing going here or whatever. I've said it in a couple of comments to him, but he never gets back to me. I left the comment for him about the Syracuse, uh, the uh, video that I just did recently on the Syracuse and... Uh, I thought he might like to hear about it. I commented here. The Syracuse ancient ocean liner designed by Archimedes, then renamed Alexandria after being operated once, supposedly to, a, to voyage to Alexandria, then gifted to Ptolemy III, contained a large library with a reading room. The ship included a temple, bath, 78 tons of fresh water, a saltwater tank for edible fish and ocean fauna, etc., etc. There it sat in the harbor or dockside, never to be referred to again. Meanwhile, many of the onboard constructions in the ship were stone, and the first-class cabins had mosaic murals on the floors depicting the whole Iliad, supposedly the only place this occurred. So I hypothesized that the whole ship was turned into the floating library at Alexandria since it was already equipped with a substantial library and all the amenities. Near me right now in New York City, there is a ship docked there that is a museum, a decommissioned ship, one of the largest in the world called the Intrepid. It's an aircraft carrier, and that's not the only one. This is what is done with certain decommissioned ships, just like the Syracuse. And I left a link to my video. I like Robin's video. This was a great one on these libraries that, you know, all got destroyed, of course. But uh, I told him about the Syracuse. This is just, I don't know, sticks in my craw there a little bit. But anyway, let's look at this uh, Paleo-Hebrew alphabet here. Because I'm saying to myself, okay, so they keep on saying they find evidence. But to me, it sounds like they're finding evidence in the Americas of the Phoenicians being here. But why, you know, 
why would I say that? Well, the Phoenicians are obviously a uh, seafaring uh, trading society. That, that's why, you know, as opposed to the Hebrews who, uh, you know, were busy killing the giants over there because uh, God told them they could. But Moses couldn't go there because he got angry. If you get pissed off, and you know, while you're doing God's business, you know, you know, you ain't going to the Holy Land, even though you're Moses. For some reason, the Paleo Hebrew alphabet, also spelled Paleo Hebrew alphabet, was the script used in the historic kingdoms of Israel and Judah, specifically when recording the Hebrew language. So this is after the Exodus of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah and that would be about 1300 BC according to whatever baloney timeline they go by but that's what they say but you know the Phoenicians uh, come before so anyway it is a regional variant of the Phoenician alphabet a term used when referring to epigraphy found along the Levantine coast the Paleo-Hebrew or Phoenician alphabet or Paleo-Hebrew or Phoenician alphabet is an abjad of 22 consonantal letters. Okay, all consonants, no vowels. But it's Paleo-Hebrew or Phoenician. Hmm. I'm troubled by that because, see, Phoenician would be the progenitor language, you see, while Paleo-Hebrew would be a, what they would call, a regional variant. Okay, so if you're a regional variant of the progenitor language, right, that should come first, then Paleo-Hebrew, not vice versa, even when talking in this context, you see, it's done on purpose, okay, progenitor language variant, see, the immediate continuation of the proto-Canaanite script used in the late Bronze Age Use of the term Paleo-Hebrew alphabet is due to a 1954 suggestion by Solomon Birnbaum, who argued that, quote, to apply the term Phoenician to the script of the Hebrews is hardly suitable, unquote. So it's hardly suitable, I'm... You know, that's not like the language of an academic to me, really. It's just sort of somebody who has maybe, um, I don't know, a bit of, I don't know, bias towards what this may be. So it popped into existence in 1954 as a suggestion by Solomon Birnbaum, who's a historical researcher. And I'm sure he takes a lot of his history from this guy right here, Josephus, see, Titus Flavius Josephus, okay, this sellout, okay, or whatever this cockamamie story is, the Romans wanted to kill him, made him a slave, and that he was with him for a long time, then he was freed, and then he was a historian for the Caesar, and he's going to write the history at the Caesar's because so much so that he took the Titus uh, Flavius' name, okay? So basically you have a story of somebody suffering from... Uh, um, um, what you would call it, syndrome. Um, shoot. Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. Basically, you got a guy who's suffering from Stockholm syndrome giving the history of the Jews that everybody's going to go by. You see what I'm saying? 
So that's uh, no good, see? Uh, but you got to know something about history and something about the past and there's lots of other things, but this is, uh, you know, nonsense, okay? You can't just pop it into existence, okay? Oh, you know, what are you trying to say here, okay? So I got heaven man's mayonnaise. I think you know the mayonnaise that I'm talking about, right? And I slapped my Bud Cat 7 label. I ripped that label off and slapped my Bud Cat 7 label on it. Is it Bud Cat 7 mayonnaise now that I slapped my label on there? Is it? Or is it still a uh, heaven man's mayonnaise? Come on now. The earliest known examples of Proto-Hebrew writing dates to the 10th century BCE. So, okay, so it's pretty far back. And this is not the oldest language, you know. You know, according to them, right? Mainstream academia, as far as everybody knows, it's got to be Sumerian, right? Well... Um, no, as you can see here, the Tartarian Tablets, one of the videos, pretty popular video on my channel, World's Oldest Writing, and they poo-pooed this guy's research, one of these guys' research specialists in uh, this archaeology that was done in Romania, in a place called Tartaria, and they dug up these tablets, and everybody said, ah, it's a bunch of nonsense, it's a bunch of scribbles and doodles and all kind of stuff. So, those researchers who are capable of looking into this archaeology did so. And one of them finally found out, and I mean, I saw an article written about it before they found out what it was, and then afterwards... Okay, when the world specialist and the only team of specialists who could look at this thing figured out that it was a language. When the oldest, like a proto-Hungarian language in Romania there. So it's, you know, if you're thinking Sumerian's the oldest language, well, it isn't. Here it is. The Tartarian tablets, world's oldest writing. Just see, the guy can't be refuted because he's the specialist. He's the only one who could be deciphering these things. Somebody who's, uh, you know, a, a, spe a specialist academic in these languages. Okay? So, it's not Sumerian. It's about 7,000, 8,000 years old. And there's evidence of older writing than this, obviously. All right? So, just, you know, I did a video on it, and, you know, if it's Proto-Hungarian, that would probably mean the horse people, you know, the horse people of Tartaria, these horseback military specialists, equestrian military specialists, the horse people, yeah. Up there somewhere. Uh, I got another video on that. So, you know, I just, it's not the oldest language. The Sumerian is not the oldest language. And neither is Phoenician. But also, when they find this stuff in the Americas, and people say, well, it's, a, you know, I'm an expert in you know, proto, uh, you know, Paleo Hebrew, and uh, okay, well, here it is. It's Sumer, it's Phoenician. Okay, so, I don't know. But. <laughs> Listen to this nonsense. The earliest known examples of Proto-Hebrew writing is the 10th century. By the 5th century BC, the alpha had been mostly replaced by the Aramaic alphabet, as used in the Persian Empire, itself a descendant of, Proto of the Proto-Canaanite script. The square script variant, now known as the Hebrew alphabet, developed from the Aramaic script by about the 3rd century BCE, although some letter shapes did not become standard until the 1st century CE. By contrast, the Samaritan alphabet is a direct continuation of Proto-Hebrew. There is also some continued use of Proto-Hebrew in some religious contexts, notably in certain parts of the Dead Sea Scrolls down to the 1st century BCE. 
<clears throat> so, I mean, you know, where is that remotely resembles this, you know, it's, and what they can find of it in the past doesn't go as far back as that. But the whole thing about the Phoenicians is, too, is that they... They say they were city states, but never. There's no evidence of them being unified. Okay, so here it is, right here. Okay, so first of all, Phoenicia is a Greek word, like many of the civilizations. Okay, of the past, whatever they were. The, the names for them come from somebody else naming them. Who knows what these people called themselves? We don't know. The Sea Peoples or whatever it is, okay, so maybe there is evidence in America, but they're always making these mistakes. If anything's evidence of it is all the Native American tribe and America, all the tribe names in America were all grossly mistaken and that's a different story, but I just want to read to you what it says here. Okay, so it says here, each city state was a politically independent unit, and there is no archaeological evidence proving the Phoenicians view themselves as a single nationality. In terms of archaeology, language, lifestyle, and religion, there was little to set the Phoenicians apart as markedly different from other residents of Vermont. So, people who lived in the exact same sorts of societies with these separate city-states, no evidence of them being a single nationality, there's no archaeological evidence, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to find any in the future. And, by the way, this is this is um, fallacious reasoning, okay? It's, again, with the legal efforts, evidence of absence is not, uh, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, okay? Just because you haven't found it yet, or whatever it is, doesn't mean it, yes, it, there's no evidence proving that it is, okay? So there's nothing to disprove it either. So, you know, it's it's open to interpretation by anybody who wants to, you know, you just, and then you make this statement here of this, in terms of archaeology, language, life science, just a little to set the Phoenicians apart. It seems highly counterintuitive there, ding -a -lings. So let's read a little bit more about this junk. The Paleo Hebrew or Phoenician, or again, the Paleo Phoenician, the Paleo Hebrew or Phoenician alphabet, so either or. So you just, you know, you substitute either one here. Okay, this is what they're saying here, but not directly. Okay, and putting the the variant before the progenitor. Alphabet developed in the wake of the Bronze Age collapse. Out of its immediate predecessor script used in the late Bronze Age, Syro Hittite kingdoms during the 13th to 12th century BCE, which all those Hittite kingdoms come from like the Black Sea area. The earliest known inscription in the Paleo Hebrew script is the Zayat stone discovered on a wall at Tel Zayit in the Beth Govern Valley in the lowlands of ancient Judea in 2005. So, not until the 2000s was anything even found in this stuff. 22 letters were carved on one side of the 38 pound, 17 kilogram stone, which resembles a bowl on the other. The find is attributed to the mid 10th century BCE. The, the so called Called Ophel inscription is of a similar age, but difficult to interpret. Okay, so it's difficult to interpret, but hey, you know, let's just do whatever. And may be classified as either Proto Canaanite or as Paleo Hebrew. Hey, take your pick. The, the Giza calendar is of uncertain date, but may also still date to the 10th century BCE. Uncertain, but May also still, so whatever. The script of the Zayat stone in the Gezer calendar, an early form of then the classical Paleo Hebrew of the 8th century and later. This early script is almost identical to the early Phoenician script 
on the 10th century a Hurum sarcophagus inscription. By the, by the 8th century, a number of regional characteristics began to separate the script into a number of national alphabets, including the Israelite, Israel and Judah, Moabite, Moab and Ammon, Edomite, Venetian, and Old Aramaic scripts. So, it's all botched up and upside down and backwards, and it, it, people say a lot of different things about it, but let's go on. Linguistic features of the Moabite language, rather than generic Northwest Semitic, are visible in the Meshistel inscription, commissioned around 840 BCE by King Mesha of Moab. Similarly, the Tel Dan Stel, dated approximately 810 BC, is written in Old Aramaic, dating from a period when Dan had already fallen into the orbit of Damascus. The oldest inscriptions identifiable as Biblical Hebrew have been long been limited to the 8th century BCE. In 2008, however, a potsherd ostracon bearing an inscription was excavated at Kerbet Kiefa, which has since been interpreted as representing a recognizably Hebrew inscription dated to as early as the 10th century BCE. The argument identifying the text as Hebrew relies on the use of vocabulary. Okay, so, you know, somebody wants to make an argument about it based on the use of the vocabulary in it. From the 8th century onward, Hebrew epigraphy becomes more common, showing the gradual spread of literacy among the people of the Kingdom of Israel and the Kingdom of Judah. The oldest portions of the Hebrew Bible, although transmitted via the recension of the Second Temple period, are also dated to the 8th century BCE. Use in the Israelite Kingdoms The Paleo-Hebrew Alphabet, or Phoenician Alphabet, was in common use in the kingdoms of Israel and Judah throughout the 8th and 7th century BCE. During the 6th century BC, the time of the Babylonian exile, the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet was gradually replaced by the use of the Imperial Aramaic alphabet. The letters of, of Imperial Aramaic were again given shapes characteristic for writing Hebrew during the Second Temple period, developing into the square shape, quote-unquote, of the Hebrew alphabet, which I've heard referred to in uh, some of these inscriptions on stone here in the Americas, the square-shaped Hebrew alphabet. The Samaritans, who these are just totally different people altogether, the Samaritans, and you can tell by the name where we get it from, just like a good people who like want to help people. Of course, you know, got to be persecuted if you want to help people. That's a bad thing. Who remained in the land of Israel continued to use their variant of the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet called the Samaritan script. After the fall of the Persian Empire, Jews used both scripts before settling on the Assyrian form. So, it's, you know, the whole Hebrew language has gone through all these gyrations and whatnot. The Paleo-Hebrew script evolved by developing numerous cursive features, the lapidary features of the Phoenician alphabet being ever less pronounced with the passage of time. The aversion of the lapidary script may indicate that the custom of erecting stelae by the kings and offering votive inscriptions to the deity was not widespread in Israel. Even the engraved inscriptions from the 8th century exhibit elements of the cursive style, such as the shading, which is a natural feature of pen and ink writing. Examples of such inscriptions include the Siloam inscription, numerous tomb inscriptions from Jerusalem, and the Kedof Hinnon amulets, a fragmentary Hebrew inscription on an, on an ivory which was taken as war spoils, probably from Samaria to Nimrud. The hundreds of 8th to 6th century Hebrew seals from various sites and the Paleo-Hebrew Leviticus scroll, scroll of Paleo-Hebrew or Phoenician. So get them, you know, it's either or. It's the way they've been characterizing until this part, you know, we get rid of the Phoenician stuff here. Now that we're talking about, you know, all the real Hebrew history here. Leviticus scroll discovered near the Tel Qumran. The most developed cursive script is found on the 18 Lashish Ostraska, 
letter sent by an officer to the governor of Lashes just before the destruction of the first temple in 586 BCE, a slightly earlier, circa 620 BCE, but similar script is found on an ostracon excavated at Masad Hachabiahu, containing a petition for redress of grievances, an appeal by a field worker to the fortress governor regarding the confiscation of his cloak, which the writer considers to have been unjust. And, you know, if you know about the Old Testament, and I do because I'm a Bible scholar, okay, it's all about how the Jews could never do what God asked of them ever. Not ever. Every time God asked them to do stuff, they like, nah. <laughs> and that's what the Old Testament is about. It's about all the stuff that the Jews couldn't do to honor their deity. And eventually he became so mad at them and said, Oh, you know what? Get lost, all you. After the Babylonian capture of Judea, when most of the nobles were taken into exile, the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet continued to be used by the people who remained. One example of such writings are the 6th century B.C. jar handles from Gibeon on which the names of wine growers are inscribed. Beginning from the 5th century B.C.E. onward, the Aramaic language and script became official means of communication. Paleo-Hebrew was still used by scribes and others. The Paleo-Hebrew script was retained as an archaizing or conservative mode of writing. It is found in certain texts of the Torah among the Dead Sea Scrolls, dated to the 2nd to 1st centuries BCE, and all these manuscripts, and the Leviticus scroll, and some Qumran documents. Yahweh is written in Paleo-Hebrew, while the rest of the text is in Aramaic square script. The vast majority of Hasmonean coinage, as well as coins of the First Jewish-Roman War and Bar Kabbalah's revolt, bears Paleo-Hebrew legends. The Paleo-Hebrew alphabet fell completely out of use only after 135 CE. And a legacy, Samaritan alphabet. The Paleo-Hebrew alphabet continued to be used by the Samaritans over time developed into the Samaritan alphabet. The Samaritans have continued to use the script for writing both Hebrew and Aramaic texts until the present day. The comparison of the earliest Samaritan scripts and the medieval modern Samaritan manuscripts clearly indicates the Samaritan script is a static script, which was used mainly as a book hand. Babylonian Talmud. The Talmud sages do not share a uniform stance on the subject of Paleo-Hebrew. Some state, and listen to this, what they say, some stated that Paleo-Hebrew was the original script used by the Israelites at the time of the Exodus, while others believe that the Paleo-Hebrew merely served as a stopgap in a time when the ostensibly original script, the Assyrian script, was lost. According to both opinions, Ezra the scribe, 500 BCE, introduced or reintroduced the Assyrian script to be used as the primary alphabet for the Hebrew language. The arguments given for both opinions are rooted in Jewish scripture and or tradition. So, meanwhile, it's rooted in the scripture and tradition, but different traditions and different scriptures, and they can't agree on it. And a third opinion in the Talmud states that the script never changed altogether. It would seem that the sage who expressed this opinion did not believe that the Paleo-Hebrew ever existed, despite the strong arguments supporting it. His stance is rooted in a scriptal verse, which makes reference to the shape of the letter Vav. The sage argues further that, given the commandment to copy a Torah scroll directly from another, the script could not conceivably have been modified at any point. This third opinion was accepted by some early Jewish scholars and rejected by others, partially because it was permitted to write the Torah in Greek. Okay, so, you know... It's more convoluted as it goes on. Contemporary use. Use of Proto-Hebrew in modern Israel is negligible, but it is found occasionally in nostalgic or pseudo-archaic examples. Ergo, on the coin, whatever, I guess, their Judea coin, and a logo of, of the Israel town, Nariah, from Deuteronomy, let Asher be 
blessed with the ch with children. Archaeology. In 2019, the Israel's Antiquities Authority unearthed a 2,600-year-old seal impression while conducting an excavation in the city of David containing Paleo-Hebrew script, and which is thought to belong to a certain Nathan Melech, an official King Josiah's court, in, official in King Josiah's court. So, maybe they're always trying to prove the Bible or whatever the facts are, and it could be facts in the Bible. Who says it isn't? Could very well be. I believe there is, but you know, there's a lot of storytelling there too. It went around, 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 and if, uh, Josephus had anything to do with it. It's all botched up. Because the emperor is there, yeah, Titus Flavius, to say, hey, what are you writing there, Josephus? Yeah, I don't like that. Change that around over there. So, let's look at the table of letters here. And the Phoenician, oh, here they got it first. See, because they got to put it this way in this context. Otherwise, you know, it's hard to understand. You see? So how they word things is made to steer you in certain ways, but here they got to be honest. So the progenitor language comes before or Paleo Hebrew. It's just a Paleo Hebrew is the variant and or it's the same thing. Characters who never stand in eyes are found in numerous variant shapes. A general tendency of more cursive writing can be observed over the period of 800 BCE to 600 BCE. After 500 BCE, it is common to distinguish the script variants by names such as Samaritan, Aramaic, etc. There is no difference in Paleo Hebrew versus Phoenician letter shapes. No difference. The names are implied depending on the language of the inscription, or if that cannot be determined, of the coastal Phoenician versus the Highland Hebrew Association that is associated with the Zayat stone, Abessidary. Okay, so, just to be clear here, okay, there's no difference in the shapes, okay. But they're saying that the variant is just a different dialect of Phoenician there. And back to just to talk about how it's clear to me that in the past they got many, many things wrong with archaeology and anthropology of these areas. And the Americas is the flagship area for that. Okay, because... When they got here and they asked the native peoples, hey, you know, we're uh, the Spanish or we're the Dutch or we're the English or, you know, we're the British or whatever, whoever you were, okay, and they said, well, who are you? They said, what do you mean, who are we? We're, we're like you, we're, we're, we're people, we're, you know, we're, we're human beings like you are. What are you talking about? What, who are we? That's what we are. And what happened was, is that the people who lived in certain areas got the area names. They say, well, what do you call this area over here? You know, where you live right here. And they called it whatever, Mantucket, Nissaquag, Ronkonkoma, uh, Nash, you know, Hempstead, and you know, whatever it is, you know, it's just they they called it whatever it, wherever the area was where they lived. So, you know, it wasn't their name or anything like that. And often, all these different tribes, as they wanted to pin them as or whatever, were just relatives of the other Indians elsewhere on, let's say, Long Island, where I'm at. Okay, and throughout the whole New England and East Coast area, okay, so, and the second way of naming all the native tribes was by pejoratives from other tribes, okay, so other tribes had pejorative names for the tribe living adjacent to them or whatever it was, and then they adopted those names for those tribes, so they were pejorative names of from other tribes, okay, so you got one of their tribes are named by the areas they lived in, one by the pejorative names of other Indian tribes, and ones that were totally made up by the, like the French, for example, for the Iroquois. Okay, so you got made up names 
pejorative names and names for the areas that they lived in, okay? So this is how often this was approached in archaeology and anthropology, okay, in the past was, you know, there were all these different tribes and things, and, and it, had, it wasn't like that at all. They got it all wrong, and many of these people were related to each other by some way, shape, or form, by marriage or other things. You can read all the anthropology for the Native American industry with his lengthy and all the stories and histories, you know, within the, you know, the, at least in the, um, when they started doing this seriously um, in the 1800s, really. So, you know, this is what they've also got wrong about the Phoenicians and the city-states and there's no proof of them being unified, yet they all doing the same thing and everything else. So it's, you know, they all shop at the same grocery store, but they're all different. You know, they're not unified in any way or whatever. It's, you know, to me, it just sounds so ridiculous and contrary and counterintuitive. It's nonsense. So anyway, here's all the letters here, and you can look at them here of Phoenician or, you know, Paleo Hebrew or whatever it is. Okay, so his Phoenician numbers and all kinds. So it's the same letter system. So let's look at the Phoenician alphabet here. All right, so without getting too far into it, I don't have to read the whole thing. I showed you the um, history on it and the spread and the, you know, if you want to read all about that stuff. I'm just talking about the Paleo Hebrew here. So here's the Phoenician one. See? See the difference? That's right, no difference, okay? So, will you stop it with the Paleo-Hebrew uh, stuff there? Because we're not talking about Paleo-Hebrew. We're talking about Phoenicians in the Americas, all right? Not Paleo-Hebrews, okay? They're not famous for their seafaring trading culture at all. Okay, so you find something that what you think looks like Paleo-Hebrew, a variant and derivative of the progenitor language, okay, only means that, you know, we're talking about Phoenicians here, okay, and, you know, whenever I hear that, and I'm thinking about this, you know, I think about also um, Burroughs Cave and Harry Hubbard and his friend Paul Schifranke and their deciphering of some sort of strange hybrid language that was etched into stonework that was found in Burroughs Cave and all these artifacts and they were able to understand some things about the mystery of Burroughs Cave and, I, you know, if you want to know about somebody who could crack ancient languages, it's Harry Hubbard and his buddy Paul Schifranke go to Harry's channel and watch some of the uh, videos there on Burroughs Cave and uh, Illinois Cave. So, you know, you want to see some fascinating videos on ancient languages or whatever, but found in the Americas. But again, this is why I'm doing this on the Paleo Hebrew, because I heard it mentioned some while back while reading through the accounts on the Giants, state by state. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, my immediate association, knowing the history of the Hebrews and the Israelites, okay, supposedly, and th this relationship to the Phoenicians and the Canaanites, I'm saying to myself, well, why, you know, why immediately go for the, you know, somebody who's, I mean, an expert, were they experts, and, you know, people looking at this, and, you know, you can, it seems it, they're absolutely identical, okay, what, you know, I don't understand what, what people don't see here, but, 
it's absolutely identical and this whole cockamamie story and why bring the Hebrews into it and the Israelites into it I don't know but when you're talking about Paleo Hebrew you're talking about Phoenician right and if you're finding that kind of symbol in America or the Americas then you're probably talking about Phoenicians who had ships to get over here you see so I don't know but there sure were some big old ancient ships around in the past all right guys well I wanted to take you through that because again I, you know when you hear about it you're gonna hear about you know how this paleo, you know, paleo Hebrew or you know Hebrew or family but you know don't go there my friends okay you're going in the wrong direction but nice try but it's you know probably not you know talking about the people who had engaged in this form of trade and coming here to the Americas where there are already plenty of people and engaged in all sorts of trade internally and certainly geared up to do all the external trade on various goods and items and resources and uh, raw materials if they were smart and I think they were and it certainly shows evidence of this in their civilization so anyway guys I want to go through this paleo Hebrew thing and dispel the whole thing before you get you know somebody else reads it somewhere else and says oh well paleo Hebrew no probably Phoenician okay of the many many peoples who are coming back and forth to America and sent their agents up rivers etc etc because they needed stuff especially copper like 500 million pounds of it from Michigan alone and from wherever else I'm sure right all right guys Bugcat7 signing out peace